thanks everyone for coming in uh, after lunch. Um, uh, yes, so so this talk is about uh, the intersection in uh, cryptography and AI, and how we can use some of the concepts from from the blockchain space uh, to build AI systems that can uh, that are effective but still uh, preserve user privacy. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I work for Manulife right now. I'm a computer scientist. Uh, I used to work at NUS, uh, and I've done uh, data science stuff. Uh, so I from startups and businesses, and I'm generally interested in machine learning, uh, deep uh, neural networks, and, and cryptography. Uh, just before we start, uh, I'd like to get uh, sort of a sense of the audience. Uh, who in the room is generally familiar with concepts in uh, machine learning and just like data analysis in general? Raise your hands. OK. Uh, and who is generally familiar with uh, cryptography and privacy? Uh, so there's a lot more people uh, on the data side than on the crypto side, which is a good thing because the part of my talk is, uh, is about the cryptography. So uh, there is a quiet, even as we speak, there's a quiet revolution underway uh, in, in AI and in machine learning. And that revolution is uh, basically uh, caused by some of the uh, by the explosion in, in cryptocurrencies and blockchains and so on and, and people have been looking at that and they've been thinking about how we can use some of the large-scale cryptographic deployments which is what the actual blockchains are uh, and how, how we can take some of those ideas and build uh, AI systems which uh, can which can give guarantees on uh, privacy. Uh, so just broadly speaking, for building a decentralized and a private machine learning system, you, you, you essentially need three things. Uh, first, you need a privacy-preserving way to do computation. So you need to be able to compute functions on data uh, while providing certain guarantees on who sees what parts of the data. And then you need, uh, if you're building a large scale sort of autonomous system, uh, you would want to have some kind of economic incentive for participants to contribute either computation uh, or data uh, for building your models. Uh, and related to that, you need some system to be able to track and disperse uh, avoids. So um, none of this is, uh, like a lot of this is, is evolving even as I speak and, the, and my aim here is to just give you sort of a engineer's perspective of the broad landscape and uh, different sort of uh, areas in computing uh, that you can leverage to build, build systems like this. And I'll mostly focus on the first one, uh, which is the private uh, and distributed uh, computation. So uh, more concretely, the outline of my talk uh, is the following. Um, so we will first go over a differential privacy uh, and, f and then federated learning and uh, homomorphic encryption uh, and, and secure multi-party computation. So all of these are uh, essentially subfields in cryptography uh, which deal with uh, being able to uh, do computation on data while giving various kinds of uh, privacy guarantees. Now, before even I begin, right, you want to ask yourself, why does any of this matter, right? Why, why go through the trouble of like learning all of this and, and building things and, and it's not easy and, and why, why do it? And the answer is because we as a society are struggling to balance uh, on the one hand benefits of data-driven systems uh, and on the other hand the, the risk of uh, privacy violations uh, that occur as a result of building these systems. Uh, I don't have to tell <laughs> you uh, about uh, you know, the, the various hacks uh, that have happened. I think 20, 2017 was like the year of the hack. Uh, I guess what stands out to me at least is that every single Yahoo account has been hacked. Like there's no account that hasn't been hacked. So that's, that's quite something. Uh, and all of this is because of the essential nature of the way we build uh, machine learning systems today. And what's essential about it is that in the center there is normally a corporation. 
And that corporation is collecting data from its users generally and providing some kind of service. Maybe they give you like better cat pictures, perhaps. But either that or maybe some, some other. Uh, and they collect all of this data and they centralize it and then that becomes a honeypot. Uh, I'll just let you enjoy this really nice picture that I found on the internet. But you know, maybe there is a reckoning when there is sort of a rise of the masses when they realize that you know that we've stolen all of their data. So the thing is, data is like nuclear waste in the sense that once it leaves your confines, once it le once it gets out of your hands and is in someone else's hands, uh, you can't really like you can't really track it. You can't once it's gone, it's just uh, kind of outside of your control. And we respond with regulation as a society. Uh, so, so that's kind of why all of this matters. That's why you want to decentralize uh, all of this. And crypto ML is kind of this promised uh, techno, uh, you know, I wouldn't say wonderland, but this promise, which is that you can build systems which work on data and you can still maintain privacy. And how do you do it is, is how, so, here, I'm here to sort of let you get you started on thinking about how you do that. So, so let's get down to sort of the specifics. Um, so the first option when it comes to building uh, data-driven systems while respecting user privacy is what's called differential privacy. So differential privacy basically deals uh, with the following. Let's say, imagine that I want to study the incidence of diabetes in, this, uh, in the population, uh, perhaps in this room. So let's say I have uh, a database with, uh, uh, with the survey results of uh, diabetes, uh, you know, uh, survey results of that, that tell me whether or not you have diabetes. And I invite you to participate. Now, if you participate, uh, and I have access to the database before you participate and after you participate, and, then, and if I have access to that database, then I can infer whether or not you have diabetes. Because if you have, then sort of the diabetes count will increase by one. And if you don't have diabetes, then you know it stays the same. Um, and differential privacy is, generally speaking, the set of techniques that you can uh, deploy to be able to issue these kinds of queries to database, to databases, while while making it hard for me to infer whether or not uh, you, in particular, for example, suffer from diabetes or not. And the way you do it is, is the following. So imagine that you have two data sets, right? So the picture shows two data sets. And they are identical except for a single row. Um, what you do in a differentially private system is you create this proxy layer. What this does is it takes your query and runs it as you normally would on a database. And on the return path, you add a controlled amount of noise. Um, so for example, let's say there's 100 people in this room and uh, there's 50 of them who already have diabetes and I ask you to participate. Uh, and in a differentially <coughs> private uh, database, uh, after you participate, and then if I query the system after your participation, I might get, for example, for example, I might get 51 or 49 or 48 or 52. Uh, what's happening is that the actual count of the the actual count of the number of people who do have diabetes you take that and then you add one or two or minus one or minus two with a certain probability uh, now when you do that if i look at the result i can't tell for sure you know whether or not you actually have diabetes because the result might be the result of the true incidence counts plus some some amount of noise like it, the count might be increased by one or two or decreased by one or two based on a certain uh, probability distribution. So in general, what you want to do is you want to add the noise in a way that, uh, in a way that the results of the queries look statistically similar for similar data sets. And that's what this picture is trying to show you, is that here are two data sets. They are identical except for a single row. Uh, therefore, the probability distribution of the result of a database query uh, mostly looks the same. Uh, and because it mostly looks the same, it's only slightly different, you can still, your analytics is still valid. Uh, 
though you do lose some amount of precision, but it is hard for you to sort of pinpoint whether the particular distribution is the result of a, a given row being a one or a zero, or being of you know one kind or, or a different kind. So, so that's how differential privacy works. And in fact, what you can do is uh, you can create uh, these uh, what's uh, you, you can create these uh, privacy budgets, which are mathematical guarantees of the risk of violation, of the risk of me being able to infer whether or not, uh, in this particular example, you, you have diabetes. And you can trade off this budget with the accuracy and precision. Uh, because you're adding noise to the results of these queries, the more noise you add, the you know the more precision you lose, uh, but the stronger the privacy guarantees that you can provide. So so that's your first option when you when it comes to building uh, private machine learning systems. Now you might think to yourself, oh, this kind of looks like we are done. You can compute functions on data, and you can you can give strong guarantees on the level of privacy. Uh, so what what's left? Well, uh, the problem is that in a differentially private system, you're creating like this trust boundary, <coughs> right? So this trust boundary is this proxy layer which is adding noise. Uh, and the analyst, or the data miner, uh, he sits on one side of the boundary and he issues these queries. But on the other side of the boundary, you still have you know, the primary raw, so raw form of the data. And if that gets hacked, then you know, you're, you're done. Then, uh, you violated everybody's privacy. So, so there's a centralization risk when you, when you use differential privacy. So, so that's not the be all and the end all of private ML. So the next option that you have uh, with respect to building uh, private machine learning systems is what's called a federated learning. Uh, this is mostly famous because uh, Google does it and they write about it. Uh, but uh, in practice, it's kind of hard to find open source tools that uh, can help you actually build uh, federated learning systems in, uh, 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 by yourself. But nevertheless, it's, it's worth noting. So what happens in federated learning is rather than the users send their data to the corporation, the corporation breaks up its models and sends you chunks of the models for you to, uh, for you to train uh, like locally. So you train, you, you, you train the model on your local data, perhaps on your phone, and you upload your gradients. And the corporation takes everybody's gradients and uh, uh, combines them and then builds a model. So the corporation does not you know, need to have access to your particular uh, private data set that's living on your phone. Uh, so so that's, that's federated learning. It's promising. Uh, but uh, sort of in the design space of the options that you have with respect to building private machine learning systems, I would say uh, the number of open source tools and uh, packages that are available are relatively fewer uh, for federated learning. So the third option that you have um, is uh, homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption uh, is basically uh, it's this promise. So let's say you, you're you're this person, right? This, the client sitting sitting there, and and you want to delegate your computation to the cloud. Uh, perhaps you want to upload your pictures, and you want to be able to search uh, through your pictures. Uh, but you don't want your cloud provider uh, to be able to actually see your pictures. So you want to, what you want to do is essentially you want to send an encrypted copy uh, of your uh, pictures to your cloud provider. And you want your cloud provider to still be able to give you useful services such as maybe search. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, how do you do that? So homomorphic encryption is this entire sort of sub-branch uh, of cryptography, which deals with building this uh, encryption schemes where you can, uh, where they have certain uh, special properties. And the properties are that uh, they are homomorphic with respect to uh, the the ciphertext and the plain text are homomorphic uh, with respect to uh, are it, like addition or multiplication. Uh, essentially, what that means is uh, you are able to take the encrypted text of two pieces of data and you add them, uh, and the result would be as if you had taken the plain text 
and edit them and pass them through the same encrypt encryption function. So uh, just uh, to help you visualize, right, let's say you have a homomorphic uh, encryptor uh, here, and you pass three, the number three, through the encryptor, and you get, a, get an encrypted uh, version of three, which is cipher A. And then you pass five through the encryptor, and you get an encrypted version of five, which is cipher B. Uh, and now what you can do under a homomorphic uh, encryption scheme is you can take uh, you can do arithmetic on the cipher text so you can do two times cipher a uh, and the result will be an encrypted piece of data which will be meaningless to you unless you have access to the decryptor and if you pass that through the decryptor you get six uh, which is you know three two times three uh, so similarly you can you can add cipher text a and b uh, and uh, pass them through the decryptor and you get uh, what was A plus B, which is uh, 8. So uh, homomorphic encryption uh, has been sort of uh, actually under, like it, it's, it's been something that cryptographers have, be, have kept an eye on uh, for, for a pretty long time. And uh, when I say homomorphic encryption, uh, there are sort of various uh, varieties, kinds of homomorphic encryption. So for example, L gamal and RSA <coughs> are multiplicatively homomorphic. So what that means is you can do multiplication on the encrypted uh, pieces of data, and they will behave as if you had uh, multiplied the, the plain text. And there is something called the Pallier scheme, which is an encryption scheme, and it is additively homomorphic. Uh, the holy grail in homomorphic encryption is to be able to build uh, an encryption scheme which is additively and multiplicatively homomorphic at the same time. And that's kind of uh, very challenging. Uh, it can be done, uh, but uh, what typically happens in practice is that uh, the computation time uh, blows up uh, for non-trivial uh, computations on uh, encrypted data under a homomorphic uh, encryption scheme. And uh, even if you manage to build a practical homomorphic uh, encryption scheme, uh, you, st you still uh, are faced with the problem of uh, coordination. That is, if you have you know, multiple people contributing data to build like a shared model, and if you're gonna use homomorphic encryption to do that, uh, the question remains who, who distributes the keys? So whoever distributes the keys can, uh, can sort of uh, cheat and uh, peek at your data because they have the keys after all. So, so you, you still, that is a problem that still remains. Uh, here are some references uh, for you to sort of uh, look into uh, homomorphic encryption in, in more detail. There's a couple of uh, libraries. There's sort of the, the most uh, famous one is what's called HELib. It stands for homomorphic encryption lib. Uh, uh, there is also Python Pallier, uh, which is a Python implementation of the Pallier encryption scheme. And uh, the first paper by Craig Gentry, uh, this is the one that sort of showed for the first time a practical fully homomorphic uh, encryption. So that's definitely worth a read. Okay, big picture. So where are we? So. We went through differential privacy and federated learning and homomorphic encryption. And hopefully you have a broad understanding of how they work. The first, the, the final option with respect to private computation is what I what is what's called secure MPC or secure multi-party computation. So this is the one that we will delve into in, uh, in depth and uh, hopefully uh, you get a deeper sense of how, how you can implement uh, some of it. So secure multi-party computation. Uh, imagine that uh, you have uh, six parties, six people, x1 to x6, and let's say they all want to uh, compute the sum of their salaries. How would you normally do that uh, without revealing your salary to, to your friends? Uh, kind of the 
conventional way to do that is to elect a trusted third party, and each person sends the third party their, their salary, and that party computes the sum and uh, broadcasts it. Now, hopefully, there must be a better way, because uh, this third party you know, is, a, is a critical dependency, and, and you don't want trusted third parties. So secure multi-party computation deals with the following question. Let's, let's say you have parties P1 to Pn, and let's say they each hold uh, pieces of data x1 to xn. Uh, secure multi-party computation deals with the following question. Given a function f, any arbitrary function f, which operates on either x1 to xn or any subset of x1 to xn, can you compute f without revealing any of x1 to xn to anyone except xi, without revealing, uh, without revealing your share, which is xi for party pi to anybody else. So is that at all possible? The answer is yes, it is actually possible. And uh, in fact, you can uh, prove that uh, under certain assumptions, so under an information theoretic security model, uh, you can uh, devise protocols to compute f as long as uh, the number of malicious parties, t, is less than half of n, where n is the total number of parties. Under a different set of assumptions, uh, you can actually give guarantees for any t. So to build on our intuition of how this actually works, let me illustrate uh, with the very simple uh, salary example. So let's say you have six people, x1 to x6. Each of them have uh, earned a certain salary, and they want to compute the sum of their salaries without involving the third party. Here is how they would do it. You start with x1, and what x1 does is that he picks a random number, r. And he takes r, and he adds, uh, adds it to his salary, and that is m1. And he passes m1 along to x2. And what x2 does is that he takes m1 and adds his own salary and passes, passes it along to x3. And so on, they go in a ring. Each person basically takes the message that they got from their predecessor, adds up their salary to it, and passes it uh, to their successor. And when the message comes back to x1, all he needs to do is he needs to subtract the secret r uh, from m6. And that is the sum of their salaries. Now, you can do this and you haven't revealed any of x1 to x6 to anyone except, you know, except the private uh, party. But this protocol that I described earlier, uh, this only works under certain assumptions. So for example, if x1 and x3 uh, collude, if they gossip and they collude and they exchange the messages that they got, uh, they can compute x2. So the question uh, when you design secure multi-party computation protocols is, uh, can you design protocols uh, and how do you design them under various assumptions of uh, under various assumptions of collusion and gossip? So I will actually walk you through through uh, I will walk you through. Uh, actual concrete secure MPC protocol. Uh, that's It's called the SPITS protocol or the SPDZ protocol. And uh, that works in the <coughs> following way. So, so again, to sort of uh, anchor you to the big picture, we are now going to uh, sort of walk through step by step through a protocol for computing functions uh, in a shared setting. So before I actually dive into the protocol, um, I want to introduce this concept of uh, secret sharing. So let's say you have a secret S. Uh, I define, uh, I describe with this S in angle brackets to be uh, what, what I call a secret shared S. So you take a secret S and you split it into N pieces, S1 to Sn. And uh, there are various kinds of secret sharing. So if you have additive secret sharing, what that means is you take S1 to Sn, and when you add them up, you get the original secret S. So this is just a concept for you to bear in mind because uh, mo a lot of uh, MPC protocols uh, are hinged on this concept of secret sharing. 
So how do you actually implement something like this? Uh, you implement it in the following way. So you can define a function share and pass it a secret s. And in the simplest of all cases, where you have a two-party secret share, you just uh, generate a random number, uh, and that is your first secret. That's your first share, share 0. And then uh, you do secret minus share 0, uh, and that is uh, share 1. You do all of these uh, generation of uh, random numbers and addition and, and uh, subtraction in a polynomial uh, field of Q, because that's kind of generally how we do everything in cryptography. But uh, the gist is that just pick a random number, and that's your first share. And then you find the difference with the secret and the thing that you picked, and that's the second share. And if you add them up, you get back the original secret. So that, that's how you can actually implement secret sharing. And if you have these functions, share and reconstruct, uh, you can then define a private element class. Uh, a private element class uh, basically has uh, these uh, shares. And then there's a reconstruct method where you can take, uh, you know, you can take these shares and then reconstruct them to the original <coughs> secret S. So here is the idea. Uh, <coughs> if you if you have a way to add and multiply uh, these secret shares, then you can actually design uh, machine learning systems uh, which operate on distributed pieces of data, data which is distributed across multiple parties, uh, without revealing any piece of data to anyone else. And the way you do that is by decomposing your machine learning algorithm into a circuit. Uh, so if you can decompose your learning algorithm into a circuit comprising of additions and multiplications, and if you can figure out a way to add and multiply uh, in the multi-party computation setting, then you have a way to build machine learning systems in a multi-party setting. So let's look at how you can actually uh, compute these uh, primitive pieces, which is, which is the addition and the subtraction uh, and the multiplication. So first up uh, is addition. So um, you have, so this is the setting, just so that you can visualize. There are parties P1 to Pn. And you have two numbers, A and B. And they are in angle brackets. What that means is uh, each of them is secret shared across P1 to Pn. So what you do is you take A and you split it into N pieces, A1 to An, and you hand out each of those pieces. To, the, to each of those n parties. And you do the same thing with B. Now, the question is, um, how do you compute A plus B without you know, exchanging data? And it's actually really simple to do that. Uh, what happens is each person, each party, uh, they do a local addition. They take their local shares. So PI takes uh, AI and BI and adds them up and broadcasts it. So you, for example, party P1 takes A1 plus B1, and let's call that C1. And similarly, each party does the same local addition, and then they broadcast the Cs, and then you add the, the Cs, and sigma Ci is uh, actually A plus B. So now you have a way to be able to add numbers in a multi-party setting. And this is like how you can actually implement that. So next up is uh, multiplication. So how can you multiply? Uh, you can sort of run this, through, go through this in your head, but you know you can't do you can't do what we did for addition. You can't just take your local shares and do a local multiplication and broadcast them because you know secret split uh, x and y, and if you if you do sigma x i plus y i, that will not be equal to x times y. So this is perhaps uh, the most uh, kind of uh, involved part of my talk, but uh, but we'll, we'll we'll walk through it uh, step by step. So here is the is the setting. We have parties P1 to Pn. We have x and y. They are sh secret shared, and we want to compute x times y. Now, in order to be able to do multiplication in 
in a multi-party setting, uh, you need what's called like a piece of raw material. Basically, you need two random numbers, A and B, and you need their product, C. And you need to do the same sort of secret sharing protocol through A, B, and C. So our original numbers, whose product we want to calculate, is uh, X and Y. And we want to compute X times Y. In order to do that, what you do is you send this triple A, B, and C to each of these parties. So you take A, split it up, send it to each of these parties. Take B, split it up, send it to each of these parties. And take C, split it up, send it to each of these parties. And the property that A, B, and C uh, obey is that C is equal to A times B. And this can be any, any random numbers. Like A and B can be any random number. It doesn't matter. So you have the following situation. Uh, these are the parties. They have X eyes, Y eyes, A eyes, B eyes, and C eyes. And the multiplication protocol um, has a few steps. So the first step is uh, each party does the following local computation. They take X i and they subtract A i, uh, and then they broadcast it. So when you broadcast X i minus A i, and when you add up all of the broadcasted messages, uh, you get X minus A. And let's call this uh, number K1, just for easy reference. <laughs> the next step is that each of the local parties does uh, YI minus BI. And then you get this number K2. And and uh, so, so you are here. You computed K1, you computed K2. Uh, and now what you do is uh, each of the local parties will take their local piece of C, which is CI, and compute K1 times uh, BI plus K2 times AI. And let's call that ZI. Right? So, so far you've arrived at the Z. So each party holds this little Z. And now you pick uh, an arbitrary participant. So I picked participant P1. And what this participant does is that he takes his Z and adds the product of K1 and K2. So remember, K1 and K2 are, are public numbers. Everyone knows them. And finally, we come to the broadcast step. So each of them broadcasts their Zs, except for the first party who broadcasts Z1 plus K1, K2. And then if you go back and do your arithmetic, uh, you know the sum of these z's will actually turn out to be x times y. So, so that's how you do multiplication. Now, in this entire sort of protocol, you see there was no exchange of xi or yi. So that's how you can compute the product of x and y when it's split across n parties without sharing any uh, piece of uh, any part of x or y. Uh, this is just uh, a little snippet which actually uh, implements uh, the, the protocol. So back to why we are doing this. So we are doing this because uh, these are the building blocks for our circuit. Uh, now, I won't be going through how you actually generate a circuit for a given uh, machine learning algorithm, and that's kind of uh, uh, tricky. And the reason it's tricky is because this circuit can only be composed of uh, addition and multiplication. So within the uh, speeds protocol, uh, there isn't a straightforward way to do division. So what you need to do is be able to uh, adapt your ML system so that in spite of the division operations being public, uh, you can still guarantee privacy as long as your addition and multiplication is private. So this is uh, actually, uh, this GitHub link is a, a reference implementation for the speech protocol. And bear in mind, secure multi-party computation is not just the speech protocol. There's other protocols that you can use. Uh, some of them, I've listed them here. Uh, but uh, the speech one is what, uh, what we go through today. OK, so where are we? Um, so we've gone through kind of four broad cryptographic techniques to be able to do computation on private data and be able to do that in various different ways without uh, distributing the data or 
or by you know compute or by giving or by um, providing mathematical guarantees on the risks of uh, violation of uh, privacy and so so that's like the sort of the distributed private computation piece and now uh, we are still left with some of the economic incentives and and like and how you can uh, use some of the sort of uh, how you can incentivize uh, participants so uh, I want to plug this project, Open Mind, uh, which actually implements a lot of these uh, techniques that I went through. So, Open Mind is a word play on open source. It's an open source project, uh, you know, uh, where you sort of uh, do private computation and you are able to sort of uh, uh, do data mining in a in kind of an open source way. Uh, and it works in the following way: uh, you have these agents, and they they register themselves as uh, providers of either computation or of data uh, with either a smart contract uh, or or with like some other protocol and essentially they are able to do sort of uh, anonymous computations on essentially they're able to do computations or provide data without actually having access to the final model uh, and those computations generally follow uh, the secure MPC uh, more specifically the speeds protocol uh, so a lot of this is still under development, but uh, there are these uh, two specific clients. Uh, they're called SIFT and Unity, uh, which are the open mind clients for actual portable uh, deep learning. And there is this thing called GRID, which is a decentralized AI compute network, which uh, implements the sort of the distributed computation uh, infrastructure to be able to split data and you know run these protocols. Uh, there is also a part which does sort of uh, gradient auditing, where each of these parties, when they upload their gradients, you are able to track them and uh, come, and there is a certain way in which you compute their contribution to the final part, to the final model building process. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, these participants are paid like an economic reward based on sort of the uh, the, the proportion to which they compute uh, they contributed in either in terms of compute or in terms of data. So yes, yeah, so that's all I have for you. Uh, I guess uh, my call to action is uh, yeah, if you're a data scientist, learn some crypto. It's incredibly exciting, uh, and yeah, and get in touch with me if you're interested in, in things like this. I can take we'll questions. open the floor for questions. Yep. So maybe it's a silly question, but I didn't get an MCC multiplication. Why can you do a division by taking the uh, 1 over Y and multiply by that? Why can't you do 1 over X times 1 over Y? Mm -hmm. And then. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. I guess. I guess. How do you like? Yeah, how do you get to one like? If you give them one over y, you know that you've like done the inversion already. But yeah, good point. Any more questions? <laughs> If I use all this technique to build a speedboard network, how much extra time I need to spend compared to the normal? Um, <laughs> so you don't have to actually build it to like measure it, but it's quite a lot of uh, extra time. The the main uh, sort of uh, bottleneck really is being able to uh, do this decomposition of your uh, neural net to individual you know additions and multiplications. So yeah, it's. Uh, is there any research? So a lot of so open mind is where a lot of people who are experimenting with these protocols are uploading uh, implementations of specific uh, MPC uh, protocols for like specific models. So there is a lot to learn from the existing uh, implementations on open mind. I would say that's kind of the best uh, reference research that we have right now. Yes. Uh, how do you uh, incentivize or guarantee the uh, data accuracy? 
And the person actually giving valid credence or valid data? Yeah, great question. I don't have uh, all the answers, but uh, that is really uh, something that you really want to think about. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't come up with a scheme that can, uh, you know, guarantee that the person is not uh, giving uh, like uh, malicious gradients, for example. Uh, but yeah, maybe you have a reputation scheme, perhaps, uh, like a reputation of a provider who provides these gradients, something like that. But uh, that remains an open question very much. I remember in Superman's project, there's something called Oracle. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of just in the process of uh, taking away data side and telling the company or not. Otherwise, the company won't pay you, right? If you don't give the current kind of data. Well, a simple way to do it is to uh, have as a sort of a, like if you, if you create this task to like create a, a model, right? Uh, so the first simple way to get around that problem is to just not release your holdout set uh, and then check the results of you know the person's uh, the party's gradients you take their gradients build your model and like check their check the results on their holdout set so as long as you don't disperse the holdout set you have sort of a like a litmus test for the quality of gradients that you that they come back with there's more on the computation side rather than the data side. Like you can verify computation, but you can't verify. You can't keep the data private, but still verify it's authentic. Not sure. Do you? Uh, because I mean, the idea is that you want to keep your private data private, right? mm -hmm. but you also want to verify that it's actually yes. true data. <coughs> Uh, so you mean from the perspective of the person who's setting up the task, uh, like the model building task, or the data provider, the data provider's task? Like you mean you, in the sense that you, let's say, uh, set up a task to perhaps build an image classifier, and then the data providers who provide like sample images for training, and you're saying that you want to figure out a way to verify the integrity of those images. Is is that what you're saying? Yeah, I guess it like often comes down. The, the simplest way I can think of is again to uh, before when you set up this task is uh, you as the sort of the task like the bounty uh, creator uh, have a private uh, data set of uh, images that you can verify the uh, like the final model against. So the sum of like the combination of the data providers and the computation like you take both of those and compute like the quality. And that can be a measure of contribution. Yes. Uh, Maybe one last question. Yep. Uh, oh, this is great for uh, deterministic computation. Uh, what happens if you have uh, computation that requires a non-deterministic, uh, for example, just compute a, a, a random number, not from a PID, but like some real randomness, and then like have, have the network agree on a random number? Have the network <coughs> agree on a, on a random number? <coughs> But let's say you have to be like, you want to randomize some data or something, and so you want to add a random number, but everything has to agree on that random number. All of the nodes have to agree on the same random number. So how can you get them to coordinate so that they don't pick, one node might pick a number which is beneficial to it, or something like that? Um, you mean, do you want to uh, agree to a random number as a sub piece of perhaps the multiplication protocol, or like outside of these protocols, you just want the whole uh, network or either all of them to? The, the first one? Either of them. Yeah. Yeah, either of them. Um, do, so for the first one, where you are providing these random numbers as a sort of a raw, like what do you call as raw material for the multiplication protocol, that, that random number is sort of a third party trust, like you are trusting the person to give you good random numbers. Whereas if, you're, uh, whereas if you want to do the second one, which is get all of the parties to agree on any random number, I think that's a lot more trickier. Can you just do like a sum and every node thinks of its own random number and they sum them together? Yeah, you could do that, yeah. All right, thanks guys for running out of time. So